Why aren't Boeing spacesuits compatible with a SpaceX Crew Dragon? What's the scenario where Butch and Sonny might have to come home on a spacecraft without suits? What is going on here? To be clear, there's still no final decision. NASA will likely tell us which spacecraft Butch and Sonny are coming home on late this week or early next week. But while we're waiting, let's dive into some of the nitty-gritty spacesuit questions I've been getting in the wake of last week's press conference and update from NASA. If you need an update on where NASA is with this decision and how a contingency plan with the astronauts coming back on a SpaceX Crew Dragon instead of Boeing Starliner would work, then check out my previous video. But right now, let's talk about spacesuits because I've been getting so many questions on this. Let's start with the basics. There are two types of spacesuits to think about here. The first is an EVA suit, which is basically a spacewalking suit. These are the suits that NASA astronauts wear to perform repairs during spacewalks on the ISS. For more on the problems with those suits, because yes, those suits called advanced EMUs definitely have their own problems, check out my video. The second is a suit used within a spacecraft. They can be called different things, often a launch and reentry suit. These are much more lightweight, less rigid and softer, mainly designed to protect the crew in case of loss of oxygen, fire, loss of pressurization, that sort of thing within the capsule. The second type of suit is what we're talking about here because it has shocked a lot of people that SpaceX suits and Boeing suits are not compatible and that Sonny and Butch would need SpaceX suits sent up to them in order to return on a Crew Dragon. If you're wondering, the Soyuz suits are also not compatible with other spacecraft. The suit is specific to the spacecraft. These suits plug into their respective spacecraft, and the plugs aren't always compatible. Because in Commercial Crew, the private companies own the vehicles, I can't actually give you specifications on how they're incompatible because that information isn't publicly available. I can tell you though that there's no adapter available to plug one suit into another spacecraft. That doesn't mean such an adapter wouldn't exist at some point, but remember we're still at a crewed flight test for Boeing. The spacecraft isn't even operational. The question is why? Why isn't this standardized? Has NASA learned nothing from Apollo 13? If you remember, there's a great scene in real life, also in the movie, which I highly recommend if you've never seen it, by the way, where they have to make a square peg fit in a round hole because the CO2 filters between the command module and the limb weren't compatible because they were made by different contractors. That's a lot to talk about here, but let's start with why these suits are needed during reentry. When a spacecraft undocks from the ISS and starts the procedures for re-entry, the deorbit burn and such, the capsule is pressurized. The astronauts can breathe, they are comfortable, the interior of the spacecraft remains at a comfortable temperature even during the heat of re-entry, because that's what these spacecraft are designed to do. Wearing a launch and entry suit during re-entry is just a safety precaution. If something goes wrong during re-entry and there is a depressurization of the spacecraft, wearing the suits will offer some measure of protection. Astronauts don't actually have to wear the suits to come back safely. It's just one of the ways NASA mitigates risk and cuts down on the odds of loss of crew. In an emergency, crew can and will absolutely come home unsuited if necessary. It's not inherently dangerous. And this is why NASA was talking about a possible unsuited re-entry for Butch and Sonny during the media conference last week, which is something people really freaked out about. It's not actually a huge deal in terms of it's only for an emergency situation and only for a short period of time, as I will explain. I mentioned this in my previous Starliner video, but whenever astronauts are on the ISS, they have to have a way to leave in an emergency. It is absolutely a requirement. There are currently two docking ports at the Harmony module of the ISS that commercial crew vehicles can dock with. Both are currently taken. The forward port by Boeing Starliner, the space port by the Crew-8 SpaceX Crew Dragon. One of these spacecraft has to undock in order for Crew-9 to launch with those two extra suits for Butch and Sunny and dock with the ISS 
if NASA does decide to bring them back on a SpaceX Crew Dragon. To be clear, Boeing Starliner is cleared to bring Butch and Sunny home in an emergency, so none of this is an issue before an autonomous undock of that spacecraft. The idea being that undocking and re-entering in Starliner is less risky inherently than staying on the ISS if there's some sort of catastrophic failure. So then why can't Crew 8 leave and Butch and Sunny have Starliner for an emergency until Crew 9 gets there? Well, NASA likes to do crew handoffs, allowing an overlap between space station crews. That means that preferably Boeing Starliner would undock first autonomously, but then how would Butch and Sunny get off the station in an emergency if there was one after Starliner undocked, but before Crew 9 launched and docked? This is where the unsuited return comes into play. It's a contingency scenario only that would only occur if there was some sort of emergency on the ISS and the astronauts couldn't stay there any longer and had to leave. Keep in mind that while astronauts have had to shelter in place in their spacecraft because of debris and other hazards, the space station has been continuously occupied since the year 2000. It has never been abandoned. But space is inherently risky and the ISS is aging, so NASA has to have these contingency plans of what would happen just in case. What would occur is that before Starliner undocked, the astronauts would install some sort of seats on Crew 8 so it could accommodate two more passengers in an emergency. If NASA does proceed with this autonomous undocking, that would be in early September. Crew 9, with two extra suits, is scheduled for launch on September 24th. We don't know if there will be two extra suits on Crew 9 or four crew members on Crew 9 until NASA makes this final decision. But if NASA proceeded with the autonomous undock option, that would be a span of two or three weeks where, if there was an emergency on the ISS, Butch and Sunny would have to jump in the Crew 8 Crew Dragon and come back unsuited. That's what we're talking about here. It's a narrow window of time and only an issue in an emergency. But it's space and there's always unexpected things happening. But. Again, would it all of this just be easier if Butch and Sunny could use their Boeing Starliner suits on the SpaceX Crew Dragon? Yes, it would be a lot easier if the suits were compatible. But here's why they're not. This basically has to do with the nature of commercial crew and NASA's evaluation of risk and redundancy. For every era of spaceflight before this current one, NASA used a different model of procuring spaceships. They laid out their exact needs, identified the contractor, and managed every stage of the spacecraft, from design, to development, to construction, to testing, to flights, to refits. They were deeply involved in every single thing. NASA decided to try a different approach with commercial crew. Because it was going somewhere where we were relatively comfortable with, at that point, the ISS, NASA decided to basically partially fund the development of these spacecraft, but allow private companies to design and innovate as long as the companies met NASA's broad requirements and safety standards, as well as reached specific milestones, one of which is a successful crewed test flight. This also means that NASA isn't bearing the brunt of the cost. They paid a set fee for the development, test flights, and subsequent flights, and if the contractor went over budget, that was their problem, not NASA's. Compare this to the ballooning costs of SLS, which is the Artemis program rocket. That will probably end up costing NASA an estimated $4.1 billion per launch. NASA has been in less than ideal budget circumstances for a while now. Anything they can do to get costs down without increasing risk or compromising on safety is a huge win. For context, the space shuttle in the end was about $1.5 billion per flight, whereas NASA paid SpaceX $65 million per flight in this latest round of commercial crew flights. Keep in mind, space shuttle could carry up to seven astronauts, Crew Dragon can carry up to seven, but NASA has it contracted for only four astronauts per flight for commercial crew, a little more on this later. But even with that caveat, it's a huge monetary difference. It's part of why commercial crew is so important to the organization. Keeping costs down in one area means they can do more as an agency. But the appeal of commercial crew wasn't just about cost. It was also about innovation. NASA wanted these companies to bring their fresh ideas, their cultures, their business practices. In this case, given what we know about Boeing now, maybe not the best idea. 
but they also wanted them to bring their innovation to the table to basically push what NASA can do. Remember, the space shuttle was heritage technology. Even into the 2000s, the flight software was from the 1970s. NASA wanted to bring something new to the table with commercial crew. Basically, that meant NASA provided a list of technical requirements that were divided into system safety, control of the spacecraft, and crew survival and abort requirements. These included abort systems, manual override of automated systems, and launch and entry pressure suits. It did not specify that these suits needed to be cross-compatible. That may seem like a huge oversight, but it's also a way NASA controls risk. If the suits used the same type of plug and some sort of flaw was found within that plug or some other sort of standardized connector, it would ground both spacecraft. After their experience with the shuttle, NASA wanted Crew Dragon and Starliner to be as dissimilar as possible. That's why they didn't mandate standardization here. It's part of how they define redundancy. Part of it is also they just didn't want to stifle innovation by mandating too much. And keep in mind that the suits are also specifically designed to work with a particular spacecraft. It would have been a ton of work and a ton of money to make them cross-compatible. It's not just about physical protection. They plug into the spacecraft and have a lot of electronics, temperature control, pressure regulation, all that sort of thing. Even if the Starliner suits could plug into the SpaceX craft with an adapter or universal plug, the software may very well not be able to talk to a Crew Dragon. And then there's the question of where they'd plug in. As I mentioned, while Crew Dragon is capable of carrying up to seven astronauts, commercial crew only has it configured for four. That means that even if Butch and Sunny's Starliner suits were compatible with the SpaceX Crew Dragon, there would be nowhere for them to plug the suits in. To be clear, I am not defending NASA here, I'm just explaining the thought process. I also think it would make a lot of sense if the suits were cross-compatible. But like everything in spaceflight, it is just more complicated than it first appears. But for now, that is about all I have to tell you about Starliner and Crew Dragon spacesuits. Thank you for watching. I am Swapna Krishna, and this is Ad Astra.